Well, hello, boys and girls. Welcome to another scintillating, didactic, and provocative uh, session of commercial law and uh, ethics. Well, we have lots of exciting things to talk about today because securities are us. This is what we're going to be jumping into today. Well, hopefully you will uh, enjoy our discussion because it's going to talk about uh, subjects that are very hot today in the business world. So we're going to look at the major federal laws like Dodd-Frank, which is uh, up for uh, discussion right now uh, in the Congress. It's already passed, uh, changes have passed, revisions have passed uh, in one house in the Senate and have gone over to the House of Representatives for further uh, discussion. So we're going to be talking about them. We're going to talk about the role of state securities laws, and then we're going to talk about shareholders and their litigation rights. So let's start at the beginning. Let's go back at the beginning. So in the beginning, I think, uh, in terms of securities regulation was uh, post-October 1929. So you all have had a couple of courses in economics at least, and so why does that date, that uh, time period, October 1929, stick out in your memory banks? Well, we had this little thing called the stock market crash, right? That sent the uh, world's uh, economy uh, into a, a tailspin. And I think it's true that if the United States uh, suffers a cold, uh, Europe and the rest of the world is going to catch pneumonia. And so that's certainly what happened in 1929. In the United States alone, over one out of four workers were uh, laid off. That's 25% of the entire workforce is laid off. That's a big deal in anybody's book. And then, of course, there was what was affectionately referred to as the banking holiday, when all of the banks in the country closed. All the banks in the country closed. So now... Whatever money you had in the bank, you couldn't get at it. Do hmm. you think this had an impact uh, on everybody? And so the question naturally arises and is being asked today. How much government regulation is needed? And so I think the question in 1929 is the same one that is being asked uh, nowadays. So how much government regulation do we really, really, really need? Now, some people would say, we don't need no government regulation at all. Hey, let's practice that great maxim caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. Hey, everybody's on their own. We don't need no government regulation. Well, you know, Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, you know, uh, had the phrase, you know, the government should only do for the people what the people cannot do for themselves. And so clearly the people were unable to control the stock market crash of 1929. And so a reaction in business, there is a reaction. And so besides sending the economy into a depression, it certainly cost President Hoover, Herbert Hoover his job and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his New Deal program were uh, elected and he came into office in 1933 to try and clean up the mess. So he foresaw and argued that, look, business has misbehaved and so we need some significant government regulation of the marketplace. And so that's where we are today, I suggest, that I think Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln were right in observing the government should do for the people what they cannot do for themselves. And what is your ability uh, to regulate uh, Facebook? What's your ability to regulate, you know, Ford uh, Motors? I don't think any of us have all that much ability to regulate them. And so do we just want to operate in a catch as catch can business environment where you know everybody is at risk and there are no protections 
I think most rational people would say, no, 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 no. The economy is so complex, we need some government regulation here to maintain fairness. And so my course metaphor, not just in this course, but in all my courses, is that the rules in business matter. The rules in business matter. And we need rules to keep, if you will, the game of business fair. Because there are always going to be, if you will, greed interests at large that are going to use positions of power and influence to you know, feed their, uh, their greed, as we've had a chance to see, and which we'll talk about further today. Well, let's begin with, you know, some definitions. You know, our old French philosopher, uh, again, Voltaire, likes to ask us, before you address me, define your terms. So let's start with a security. What is a security? I think it's true. It is an investment in which a person gives something with an expectation of profit through the efforts of a third party. So what do the elements look like? Well, we have an investor who invests money in a common enterprise and expects to earn a profit predominantly from the efforts of others. That's what we simply refer to as a security. So we would agree stock qualifies in that definition. Bonds qualify in that definition. And so we're going to dig down uh, and look at you know how uh, markets operate. Uh, using those terms. So I think the first rule uh, that we had of significance and consequence was certainly the Securities Exchange Act of 1933. So remember we had the crash in October of 1929. Poor Herbert Hoover didn't do a whole lot to try and create liquidity in the financial system. And so he got voted out of office in 1932, and Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in in March of 1933. And one of the first things he sought to do was to enact a law that would create regulation of initial public offerings, first-time sales, if you will, of securities, first-time sales. Now, clearly this was a reaction to what occurred in 1929. And so what does the Securities Act of 1933 primarily require? It requires that all those who want to issue, i.e. sell securities, whether that be stock, bonds, you know, whatever, uh, they have to first register that uh, security with Mother SEC. Now, the SEC doesn't actually investigate the quality of security offerings, but they do police the security sales marketplace. So what do they do? What does this act do for us besides that or within the scope of regulation? It prohibits any fraud. We all know what the what fraud is, right? The false representation of a material fact. We'll talk more about that in just a moment but prohibits any fraud in securities transactions, regardless of whether the security is registered or not. So fraud is, we would agree, a bad thing that violates the rule that says no, 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 in the sales of securities, fraud is not permitted. Registration has to be made with the SEC electronically. It uses an electronic system called EDGAR. EDGAR, what does EDGAR stand for? And so I recommend that you uh, Google EDGAR and you have a chance to take a look at the SEC's website. So what does EDGAR do? EDGAR is the Electronic Data Gathering Analysis and Retrieval System so that all communications that take place between companies that wish to register their security and the ongoing operation of security sales, not just the initial sales, but secondary sales, are all done through 
the Edgar electronic system. So that's how one communicates with the SEC. But the really good thing is the SEC posts this information uh, that the, the registrations that companies uh, register with the SEC. So the SEC permits but doesn't require and prohibits requiring electronic communication with investors. So <clears throat> investors can require that their uh, entities that they buy their securities from communicate with them uh, in writing or investor if you're into you know online communications can authorize uh, the company to uh, keep you posted with annual reports and things of that nature through uh, the on their online system so information is not just posted on a company's website uh, companies are required to communicate either in writing or electronically if a uh, consumer or an investor uh, consents to that and yeah you can not only have access to Edgar you know, just hey cl click in there and you get to see all sorts of things um, that you learn uh, that you may not have known before about a given security or company we'll talk more about that in just a moment well clearly <clears throat> registering with the SEC is no small activity <laughs> as we're going to see so we're going to return to that in just a moment but let's talk about exempt securities right now what are exempt securities these are if you will securities that do not have to be registered with the SEC so for example government securities like treasury bonds or savings bonds do not have to be registered with the SEC. Bank securities, you know them, some of them as certificates of deposit. Those are securities, right? They don't have to be registered with the SEC either. Short-term notes, what is short-term? Having a duration of nine months or less that are not sold to the general public, but to particular investors, uh, what we call accredited investors, or, institutions you know insurance companies pension funds and whatnot nonprofit issues by religious educational and charitable organizations so for, so for example here at the University of South Dakota uh, we issue uh, through the state construction bonds for our student uh, center here that was built with uh, bonds our wellness center that was built with bonds and now our renovation of uh, our dome is going to be done with construction bonds these don't have to be registered with mother sec insurance policies and annuities they don't have to be registered either now in addition and i'm sure all of you upon graduation some of you may be thinking about starting your own businesses and so if you're thinking all you have to do is go down to the bank and get a loan to start up your you know business uh, you're probably going to discover that you know that's a hard thing to do so how do entrepreneurs secure capital for the purpose of uh, um, starting their businesses well this is where you can find uh, opportunities and so we're going to walk through some options of how uh, an entrepreneur can raise capital through exempt transactions now why would companies be interested in looking to issue exempt securities as opposed to uh, regular uh, registration with the SEC well it's important to understand that to register a security with the SEC will probably cost well in excess of one million dollars well if all you're trying to do is raise a hundred thousand dollars why would you spend a million dollars with a registration process and so we're going to look at a number of vehicles uh, by which uh, people can raise uh, business people can raise uh, small amounts of, uh, of capital uh, without having to register with the SEC so we have what are called section uh, four uh, 
uh, offerings, which are exempt transactions that don't involve a public offering. These are private offerings. What are private offerings? These are securities that are sold to, you know, private investor firms like, you know, uh, BlackRock and whatnot. Not open, not open or sold to the general public. So yes, I think everybody should think about a business they would like to start. With that in mind, we can walk through some more of these. Um, section uh, 147, intrastate. Now, what is an intrastate offering? It means the security is only being sold within the state that it's coming from. So let's take South Dakota, an intrastate offering. Uh, could be offered within the state. Can't uh, you cannot advertise uh, across uh, state lines? It exempts, you know, securities, uh, but can only be sold to South Dakotans or businesses that have incorporated in this state. And 80% uh, of the revenue and assets have to be, you know, in this state. So that's like state school bonds, right? That we're all familiar with. So let's look at actually the most popular exempt securities, beginning with 504 securities. Now, these are the type of securities you can sell to accredited investors uh, up to $1 million uh, during a 12-month period. Now, you can advertise and solicit an unlimited number of sophisticated investors if the transaction is registered under state law with required disclosures and sales are limited to accredited investors. Who's an accredited investor? Another definition here. Accredited means institutions or wealthy individuals who have a net worth of $1 million or an annual income of 200,000. So 504 securities can only be sold to these folks. Okay. Now, if you're the security is not registered with the state. And who is it in the state of South Dakota that you register securities with? The Secretary of State is that party. But if you're not registered with the state nor sold exclusively to accredited investors, then such stock is considered restricted, which means it can't be sold, can't be resold by the original purchaser publicly or privately for one year. So that's what restriction means. When you ever hear the term stock restriction, it means it cannot be resold after the original sale for a minimum period of one year. Rule 505 securities. Now this one, I noticed where 504, we were looking at trying to raise up to, but not exceeding $1 million, 505, uh, exempt securities, you can sell up to $5 million of those during a 12-month period, providing you haven't advertised the stock publicly. Um, you can sell it to an unlimited number of accredited investors. Who are they again? Those that have $1 million of net worth uh, and, or an income of two, annual income of $200,000. But note that you are for 505 security sales, if you want to sell to unaccredited investors, and those are obviously ones who have less than a million dollars in a net worth, less than 200000 in uh, income, you're limited to no more than 35 of the unaccredited investors. So you may want to raise capital up to $5 million by, you know, selling these uh <clears throat> securities to friends and family, right? But not to exceed 35 if they're unaccredited investors, which I would bet most friends and family are. Unaccredited uh, investors have to be provided, as you might think, more disclosure information, which is certainly less than a public offering, where in a prospectus, you have to provide uh, a great deal of information about your proposed uh, investment. Stock purchased under 505 is restricted, which means what? Can't sell it for a year, right? Then we've got Rule 506, a third type of exempt security, which is just like 505, except there's no limit on the amount of stock sold. 
If you have an unaccredited buyer who's unsophisticated, then the unaccredited buyer is going to need some type of financial advisor uh, advice before they're going to be eligible to purchase. Let's talk about Regulation A securities. Regulation A securities are exempt and can be sold up to $5 million publicly within a 12-month period but you've got to provide all the purchasers of this type of security the same disclosure information as unaccredited investors under Regulation D is in Delta. Uh, <clears throat> there is another type uh, under this category in which you can sell up to $50 million during any 12-month period. Uh, investors uh, can't buy the stock if it exceeds 10% of their annual income or net worth. Uh, direct public offerings can be made under either Regulation A or Rule 504 to avoid expensive registration with the SEC. Um, so let's go back to non-exempt uh, offerings, okay? And you're probably wondering, well, so how do securities get sold? And you're thinking, well, you know, Wall Street, you know, Wall Street sells. It. Okay, how does Wall Street sell stock? One way is through underwriting. Underwriting is where you have uh, uh, an underwriter who purchases the stock from the corporation, then resells it. Uh, obviously raising the price to uh, make money on it. Now, I reckon that you see the movie out with Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks called The Post. What is The Post? The Post is a story about the Washington Post uh, newspaper, uh, which was owned by Catherine Graham, who is the publisher in the movie, played by uh, Meryl Streep. Now, she has decided... Uh, for financial reasons that the time has come that they want to go public with the Washington Post and sell 1.3 million shares uh, in the Post um, with an underwriting from a variety of banks who are going to purchase the uh, stock at $24.50 uh, a share. And uh, the movie goes into you know that uh, as well as <laughs> a crisis that uh, involved what simply became known as the Pentagon Papers. I don't want to spoil the movie for you, but it's a good uh, illustration of underwriting, where bankers get together to uh, purchase uh, the 1.3 million uh, shares, but of course they have the right to back out if some cataclysmic event uh, occurs, and that's what happens in the movie. So I don't want to spoil any more for you there. A second type of underwriting is called best efforts underwriting that uh, involves uh, agents who are selling the stock, like stock brokers, okay, like stock brokers. So they're merely acting on behalf of the seller. They're not buying the stock themselves. They're finding investors who want to buy certain types of securities. Uh, and so Goldman Sachs, for example, is an investment bank that has obviously a lot of clients, and they had brokers who called their clients to let them know when new things are coming on the market that they might be interested in. Crowdfunding. You've heard of crowdfunding before, right? What is crowdfunding? This is privately held companies can sell up to $1 million in any 12-month period, providing they sell securities through an approved intermediary such as uh, a Securities and Exchange Commission registered stockbroker, or they can file an offering statement with the SEC, and they file annual reports with the SEC, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. And, you know, they limit investments uh, <clears throat> in crowdfunding as follows. Investors who have less than $100,000 in net worth can invest no more than $2,000 or 5% of their net worth in a crowdfunding uh, equity set. Investors with more than $100,000 net worth can invest up to $100,000 or 10% of their income or net worth. 
Now, only the intermediary may be paid a potential commission. Now, it's important to see that in crowdfunding equity sales, you can they're restricted. You cannot resell them for at least one year. So what do you think the problems might be with crowdfunding? There may not be a whole lot of information out there on this particular company, right? And uh, <clears throat> it's something that you want to invest in in terms of time and effort to check out before you start doing crowdfunding. Okay, let's talk about registering with the SEC. Um, recall I said earlier that... Uh, it costs well in excess of $1 million for a business to register with the SEC for a public sale of its stock. So let me walk you through the process. The uh, pr proposed offering, uh, the selling company, has to file a registration statement with the SEC, officially notifying that it would like to sell you know, X amount of shares of stock at whatever price they propose to do that at. They disclose uh, certainly their true identity, their business purpose, their stock description, how many shares they're going to sell, the proposed use of the funds, what do they propose doing with the funds, and here's an important thing. They have to provide audited balance sheets and income statements for their company. So clearly there is a furnishing of a great deal of information to the SEC. And remember we talked about fraud. <laughs> Any false information contained herein is going to run against, as we're going to see here in a few moments, Rule 10b-5 of the Securities and Exchange Act. Now, clearly when... A registration statement is submitted to the SEC, you know, it's not always perfect. And so it's frequently called a red herring. If you will, it's a draft statement because the SEC reviews the registration, red herring, if you will, and frequently has recommendations for alteration or change or requests for more information, as you might imagine. Now, a perspective is, is different. A registration statement is what is filed with the SEC. A prospectus is what is provided to a potential investor. Now, clearly it's not as, um, doesn't contain all the same information that a registration does. And so it is certainly, uh, contains less information, is smaller in size, uh, but still includes important information that is also found in the registration statement. Now let's talk about sales periods. Uh, <clears throat> from the time a company decides it's going to you know, register its stock with the SEC, then a quiet period begins when the corporation uh, hires an underwriter and ends 20 days after a stock is initially sold to the public. Now, note here that uh, during this quiet period, a corporation cannot hype its stock. So it is truly quiet, right? The waiting period begins after the registration is filed with the SEC, but before it is approved. Now, underwriters do write tombstone ads, which are an unadorned announcement. So when you take a look at your Wall Street Journal, take a look for tombstone ads of a announcement that a security offering is going to be made in the near future and what the price of it's going to be. Now, during this waiting period, uh, the selling entity, the selling company, conducts a roadshow advertising to prospective brokers like investment banks and investors. So clearly in the movie uh, The Post, you'll see... Um, Catherine Graham, the publisher, selling, <laughs> and with the aid of some of her executives, uh, uh, making a case for why investment bankers should purchase her 1.3 million shares. So I highly recommend the movie to you. Go see it. 
The SEC, of course, ultimately is going to send the issuer a letter, uh, a critique, if you will, that in which it lists the changes it once made to the registration statement before it goes final. Then, as you might guess, the SEC always gets its way, right? So, what about selling restricted, you know, securities? Well, the Securities and Exchange Commission has what's called Rule 144 that limits uh, the sale, the resale, uh, the resale of two types of securities. Now, remember I said earlier, we have two large federal acts. We have the 1933 Securities Act and we have the 1934 Securities Act. The 1934 Securities Act governs uh, SEC Rule 144 which controls securities that are held by a corporate officer, board of director member, or individual with at least 10% uh, or more of a class of stock. Uh, in any three-month period, the insider can only sell an amount of stock that is equal to the average weekly trading volume for prior four weeks, or 1% of the number of shares outstanding, whichever is greater. So in other words, you can see there is some control in the flow of the sales of control securities. Now, what are control securities? Let's look at this deeper. They're those that are held by corporate officers, board of directors, members, and individuals uh, who've got 10% or more of a given class. Now, why is this important? <laughs> Well, if you see a corporate officer, so let's take, for example, our friends at Imclone. Sam Waxel, who was the CEO at Imclone, found out through some skullduggery that the FDA was going to deny approval of a drug patent that it had submitted. Well, CEO Sam Waxel knew that once that announcement was made by the uh, FDA, Imclone stock would go through the floor. Well, who owns a lot of stock in companies that members of the board of directors and corporate officers, you know, work for? <laughs> you got it. So clearly, um, Sam Waxel and his daughter and another person that you will be familiar with, by the name of Martha Stewart, all owned significant amounts of Imclone stock, which they promptly dumped in advance of the... Uh, announcement by the FDA. Well, we have some organizations that a lot of people don't know much about called Stockwatch, for example, which is a federal agency that watches trading uh, on the stock exchange, if you will, it provides oversight. And when it sees, and of course it's all programmed with the names of corporate officers and members of the board of directors and, and large 10% you know, uh, uh, equity holders, when they see uh, trading in their own stock, this sends up red flags, and the SEC investigates. And of course, in Sam Waxel's case, the result was he got to go to jail. Ah, uh, but you know, you need you know at least two people to play cards in jail, and so Martha Stewart went to jail with him. Okay. So those are control securities. You see why they're called control. Now, restricted securities, as I mentioned earlier, are different. These are securities uh, which are purchased in a private offering, and they can't be resold under this rule for a minimum period of one year, okay? So in other words, it's one of these securities. doesn't matter what happens. Once you buy it, you got to sit on it for a year. You can't sell it inside that time period, or that would violate this rule. So we want to talk about liability, right? We want to talk about uh, civil liability. We want to talk about criminal liability. The rules matter, right? Remember my master metaphor? The rules in business matter. So what is the liability for the sale of unregistered or non-exempt securities? Well, if you don't want to play the game by the rules and get caught, well, rescission and return of the purchase price. Uh, but if the stock is no longer owned, then there are going to be damages, whatever your damages happen to be. Ooh, for fraud, 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 fraud. 
in making material misstatements or omissions, either oral statements or written statements, with an offer or sale of a security in either public or private offerings, guess what? There is liability. So let's take, for example, our friends at Enron. So CEO Ken Lay had this, had all of these uh, all hands on deck employee meetings in the atrium of their headquarters in Houston, where he said in front of God and the whole world, there is nothing wrong with this company. It is fine. It is profitable. It is excelling. Everybody there knew he was lying through his teeth. In fact, the board of directors had even imposed a blackout period where employees could not sell Enron stock that was in their 401k account. But the 240 executives and members of the board of directors could and did sell their Enron stock for over $600 million while the employees could not. Did Ken Lay make any material misstatements or omissions about the sale of Enron stock? Well, he got convicted criminally, and before he went off to jail, he had a heart attack and died. But Jeffrey Skilling, the president of Enron, did get a chance to drive his BMW to jail. Arthur Fastow, the CFO for Enron, he got to go to jail for seven years. His wife even went to jail. So, hey, the Department of Justice does prosecute willful violations. How about Bernie Ebers? Remember Bernie, the CEO at WorldCom, the largest bankruptcy in business history? Gee whiz, Bernie got to go to jail for 25 years. Why? Fraud. Fraud. So clearly when you file a registration statement with Mother SEC, if there's any material misstatement, what's material? Something that would affect a, a, a purchaser's decision one way or another, or an omission, hey, the purchasers can recover from anyone who signs the registration statement. Hence, uh, CEOs and CFOs, as we're going to see under Dodd-Frank, want to have their lawyers, not to mention all of their accountants, carefully screen anything that they have to sign because they don't want to go to jail alone, right? They want lots of people to play cards with. So all you've got to do, I mean, this isn't brain surgery. All you have to do is show there was a material misstatement or omission and that, uh, uh, and that damages uh, the company, <clears throat> not to mention the investor. Now, if uh, the CEO and uh, the CFO and others who signed the registration, if they exercise due diligence and can prove that they exercise due diligence, in other words, if they follow the gap, then that, that could reduce their potential personal liability. So, Still within uh, the Securities Act of uh, 1934, uh, <clears throat> both of the acts together, uh, uh, well, the second act created the SEC, which has the enforcement uh, responsibility for all of these uh, rules, but the actual prosecution takes place through the Department uh, of Justice. Uh, what do these laws require? Certainly a disclosure of certain facts before securities can be sold across state lines. It regulates uh, the trade of securities and over-the-counter transactions. It investigates securities fraud. Uh, like Bernie, remember Bernie? Bernie Madoff? Bernie who made off with everybody's money? Remember Bernie who ran that Ponzi scheme on Wall Street? <clears throat> Bernie went to jail for 150 years. Bernie is still there. Bernie will be there until the day he dies <clears throat> because he was engaged in what we simply refer to as securities fraud. The SEC actually licenses stockbrokers. So they have to get licenses from the SEC, just like accountants get CPAs, lawyers get bar exams and all. And of course, the SEC does 
in fact, make recommendations to DOJ as to which miscreants need to be prosecuted. So yes, the SEC creates a law in several ways. Uh, you're familiar with uh, the Volcker rule and other types of uh, rules that have been uh, created by the SEC. Uh, it certainly uh, announces rule changes, like, for example, the fiduciary rule that is up for public uh, comment uh, before it'll be uh, applied next summer, hopefully, uh, through no action letters. There are requirements that all publicly traded companies have to make uh, annual reports, better known as 10K reports, quarterly reports, 10Q reports. And if your company has a significant development, like, you know, it's going to merge or some such thing of a significant nature, then it has to file an 8K report. And all these are available for viewing on Edgar, the SEC's uh, website. So why did Congress enact the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002? Why? 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 Remember, to every action, there is a reaction in business. So what do we have happen in 2000 and 2001? Well, we had a massive restatement of earnings, right, on Wall Street. We had the collapse of both uh, WorldCom and Enron. And so <clears throat> these created uh, an <laughs> enormous... Uh, dislocations that brought us back at warp speed with the uh, enactment of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So among the many things that it requires, and when people talk about the thousands of pages that the law uh, entails, well, <laughs> the fraud uh, involved uh, back in 2000, 2001 was so significant, we needed uh, more regulation. So what type of regulation should we be concerned with? Would you believe CEOs and CFOs have to personally sign and certify all documents, financial reports, and statements as being accurate and truthful that go to the SEC? So you see where the fraud gets you know, triggered? Certification of a false report can lead to a million-dollar fine and up to 10 years of prison for each false certification. Oh, my. Willful violations can be up to 5 million or 20 years in prison, as uh, Bernie Ebers is finding out. Destruction or alteration of documents that obstructs or impedes any proceedings, like Arthur Anderson got them involved, themselves involved in, can result in prison terms as well. Now, <clears throat> regarding uh, auditing. Audit reports are required to go to the audit committee of the board of directors. The, if there's any unlawful activity, the board of directors uh, auditing committee has a duty to report immediately to the entire board of directors who's required to report within 24 hours to the SEC using Edgar uh, that it has uncovered uh, illegal activity. So, yes, boards of directors have to self-report. And then, of course, there is Whistleblower protection and the blackout periods I mentioned uh, in the Enron caper where the executives uh, cashed out their uh, uh, Enron stock when the employees couldn't, those are now expressly prohibited. No can have blackout periods. Proxy statements. These are lawful, can be solicited uh, annually from uh, uh, Shareholders that clearly uh, are used to elect members of the board of directors and take significant corporate actions at the annual corporate meetings. Short swing trading. No, 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 no. The SEC Act requires an electronic report within two business days when there is any stock trading by a company's officers. Uh, member of the board of directors or shareholders who own 10% or more of the stock. So they are required by law to self-report within two days of engaging in selling or buying their company's uh, stock. And uh, <clears throat> if they've done it within a uh, six-month you know, uh, period, uh, it can lead to their having to turn over uh, any profits gained therefrom. Now, I've already alluded to insider trading, 
right? And that's the reason why we have these prohibitions against short swing, you know, training. They clearly, members of the board of directors and uh, officers of a company have access to information that shareholders of the public certainly do not. And so clearly using their position to profit uh, violates the rules, violates the rules. And so what are the rules? Well, <clears throat> insider trading is prohibited. That is members of the board of directors, officers, anybody within a company, an employee is prohibited from profiting on inside information not available to the public. So who are tippies? We know who tippors are, right? Tippies are outsiders who receive inside information from an insider official breaching their fiduciary duty. Now, we've talked about the F word before. Fiduciary duty is a legal duty of utmost trust. All employees, without exception, from the custodian to the CEO, owe their company a fiduciary duty. And they can be liable under 10b-5 uh, for violating duty. So Ken Lay and Jeffrey Skilling and Arthur Fastout and Enron all got sued by shareholders for violating uh, their fiduciary duty. Misappropriation, taking information that you receive at work and trading on it for personal gain can be liable under 10b-5. So the bottom line is whatever happens at work has got to stay at work. You can't come home and talk about it and potentially have your family members, you know, spread the information and create a tippy tippor situation. So note you have to prove intent to defraud if you're going to prosecute criminally, but for civil violations, you don't have to prove intent. You can just prove that fraud occurred. Now, 10b-5 that I'm, uh, I've been alluding to in the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934 makes criminal any scheme or device to defraud or making a, a false uh, or omitting a material fact in a report. So hence, that signature by the CFO and CEO of any documents going to the SEC is serious business, serious business. So let's take a look at our uh, matrix initiatives uh, versus Syrah Cassano case. So we've got a cold remedy that was uh, a nasal spray, uh, nasal spray that accounted for over 70% of the producer's revenue. But they received reports that users had developed a nosmia. What is a nosmia? The loss of smell as a result of using the product. But the company didn't do anything for three years. Why didn't they do anything for three years? Because it thought it could control the bad news, right? But then it learned that there were studies out there that linked its product with the loss of smell. Even when doctors were going to make a conference presentation, uh, Matrix wrote them, you know, essentially threatening them uh, if they made any references to uh, their product, Zcon. Well, <clears throat> nevertheless, would you believe the producer continued, even in the face of this research, uh, issuing statements that its revenues were uh, going to increase by 80%. However, it did notify in its SEC uh, 10Q filing that there were potential adverse effects of the product liability claims, financial liability, right? But it didn't disclose this to the public, that it was already being, being sued. So after the FDA disclosed it was investigating CECOM, as you might imagine, the stock price fell through the floor. They even issued a press release claiming that the anosmia claims were completely unfounded and misleading. Think that's a material misrepresentation of fact? So while the uh, stock price bounded uh, back, which was the point of the exercise, uh, guess what? <laughs> After a uh, presentation on Good Morning America, its stock went through the floor. And as you might imagine, a group of stockholders sued uh, the company that it had violated the SEC rule uh, 10B with the and 10B5 with the fraudulent statements. What's our legal issue presented? Was Matrix required to disclose allegations of harm for which there was no statistical correlation and did it violate 10B and 10B5? The court held yes, uh, they did violate that. 
they were saying one thing when they knew, you know, there was significant uh, liability uh, and uh, uh, injury and harm taking place. Good example of uh, misrepresentation. Our John Fund versus Halliburton, you know, company. Um, we've got a, uh, <clears throat> again, a company who is uh, saying great things about its potential uh, <clears throat> liabilities and expected uh, revenues. Uh, EPJ had purchased uh, Halliburton stock on the open market. Uh, the company had corrected uh, its prior disclosures. And when it did so, its stock price fell, causing the investor, EPJ, to lose money. And so the investor filed suit against Halliburton, claiming that the company's initial statements that it had made about its uh, potential liabilities and expected revenues uh, were false. And were and the investor had relied on them to their material uh, detriment. And so can the court assume that a plaintiff who purchased a company's stock relied on its misstatements? Yes, says the Supreme Court in 2014. It says, yes, investors have a right to rely upon uh, publicly uh, disseminated information, and you can assume that they did as a matter of law. Stone Ridge Investment um, versus Scientific Atlanta. So we've got a similar situation uh, where this company sought to inflate its financial statements so it would meet all of Wall Street's expectations. Therein lies the danger, right? It convinced two of its suppliers to even aid and abet its fraudulent accounting practices. But the public wasn't aware of the company's arrangement with these um, suppliers. And so while, you know, the stock uh, ultimately went down, uh, the stockholders uh, in a class action suit sued the um, aiders and abettors. But because they didn't actually know about the aiders and abettors' participation in the fraud, the aiders and abettors were not liable to the investors. All right, we're going to finish here with uh, state securities uh, registration, better known as blue sky laws, because I mentioned earlier uh, explaining intra-state sale of and transfer of securities that states, as long as the securities are not sold or advertised across state lines, uh, states uh, can regulate them. And of course, they, they have uh, similar securities uh, legislation language uh, that also prohibits 10b5 type of uh, fraudulent activity from uh, occurring. And so both the SEC and the state can prosecute securities violators. Uh, the biggest prosecutor, I think, is uh, New York. The New York Attorney General, State Attorney General, is notorious for suing everybody in sight when, you know, there is a uh, an intrastate uh, impact from a fraudulent uh, misstatement uh, activity. I caution people against online security offerings. That that's not how you should be uh, doing, you know, investment business. While you certainly can investigate uh, things online, we all know just because we see it online does not necessarily make it true. Wikipedia, right? So. Um, <clears throat> securities that are regulated by the federal government are not also regulated by the um, states. You can only have one regulator uh, at a time when it comes to these things. Well, these are the, I know this is a great deal of information, and this is just sort of a, uh, a, a quick trip through a fascinating uh, subject area. But as a component of this course, I think it's important to understand uh, that these are the rules uh, in business that impact business in significant ways, especially with respect to investor protection, which should be foremost uh, in your mind when you know uh, we think about Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, that the government should do for the people what the people cannot do for themselves. And so regulation is important for the reasons we've discussed. With that, 
let me conclude. Uh, wish you well. And as always, if you have any questions or needs, I invite your emails. I'm here to help. Take it easy. See you next week. Bye-bye.